All right, hello everyone. I'll let you get settled here. Coming back from lunch, I know it's always a, a little hard to focus post-lunch, but I promise you that we're gonna have um, an engaging and lively conversation. Um, we're gonna be talking about mobilizing billions to trillions and really the role of business and private investment in helping to close the funding gap. Um, and I am joined um, up here for this panel by Philippe uh, Vala, who is the CEO of the Private Infrastructure Development Group, or PID. Um, Phil Stevens, who's the head of the private sector department at DFID. Mahmoud Mohildin, who's the senior vice president at the World Bank Group. Denise Harut, who's executive director of sustainable finance at Standard Chartered. And Chris Club, who's the managing director for Europe at Convergence. So thank you all for being here um, and for joining us. And, and I'm going to start with perhaps an odd question, given what we've called this panel, which is uh, mobilizing billions to trillions. Because I think that um, we are in a place today where there are a lot of questions about whether that's the right narrative. And concerns that you know, we're not actually mobilizing trillions. Uh, we're not capturing the trillions that are out there and trying to get them to invest in the space. And so I, th I think I'll turn to you first, Philippe, because we've talked a little bit about this, and you, I know, have some strong opinions about um, whether this is a useful narrative for the private sector. Thanks for that. Um, I suppose at the risk of sounding a bit provocative, um, I don't find the, the use of the words billions to trillions quite helpful. Um, and for two reasons. For those of us who've worked with institutional investors, pension funds, I think we have a pretty good idea of what they need to get mobilized, whether it's ticket size, risk diversification, risk mitigation. Uh, and, and I see attempts to create yet more products and more products, first loss, second loss, third loss, et cetera. Products that have been tested and exist in the marketplace. So I, I don't find that terribly helpful because, okay, the money's there, we know it's there, we know what it takes to move, but where are the deals? So we hear sometimes there are plenty of deals. Well, there are plenty of deals, but where are the bankable deals? And where are the deals? Who's working on the upstream, the enabling environment, the capacity building to allow those pension funds to come in? And then I guess the second point that I take issues with, anyone talking about the billions to trillions agenda seems to be focused exclusively on cross-border financing. Um, based on some of the work, which I hope I'll be able to talk later, for us and for me, it's equally important to talk about domestic mobilization and mobilizing domestic pension funds, domestic insurance companies as a means to deepening local capital markets. And that, I fear, gets completely lost when we talk about billions to trillions. So I don't find it terribly helpful. Mahmoud, I wanted to bring you in because your department at the World Bank helped coin this phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, that phrase was coined back uh, in uh, 2014. And uh, that was in preparation of the ADIS uh, agenda in coordination with the rest of the MDBs. We were different times. And um, inspired by the aspirational goals, um, uh, some colleagues came up with this uh, phrase. And I told them I'm happy to th that that is being confirmed today that this phrase will come back to haunt us. Um, and um, w I had different um, um, uh, title for that joint paper. Uh, could be boring. Uh, like, uh, I think the, the uh, initial one was New Frontiers of Development Finance. But um, anyways, the general assumption there was basically about the following, that the 135 billion, 140 billion of ODA at the time on average, with the support of the MDBs and with good assumptions of leveraging and some multiplier effect that could close the realized gaps of trillions um, at the time. This is basically the kind of motivation of the phrase. The details of that paper still stand because they are about the four sources of finance, external and domestic, public and private, and with full realization of the comparative advantage of each dollar, which is not really happening today. What we're seeing that instead of crowding in the private sector, we see the private sector is being crowded out in, ma in many jurisdictions around the world. What we're seeing as well that there is a great deal of confusion 
about the role of different players in, uh, in the market. And there is, as my good colleague, uh, who is represented here uh, by, uh, by Neil from IFC, um, uh, Philip Leroux, the head of IFC, the private sector arm of the bank, had been warning us about too much of, uh, of washing, like impact washing and green washing and climate finance washing. So I think the whole thing boils down, uh, down to the following. Are there gaps? Yes, there are gaps. In a recent piece by the IMF, they uh, estimated that for a, um, a low-income country, they need really to increase their uh, funding for, by 14 to 15 percent of GDP. And for the middle income and emerging markets, they need to increase their funding and investments by 4 to 5 percent of GDP. Looking at the state of budgets today and the rising debts, with slow growth and sluggish investment, that kind of filling the gap will not really happen without a bigger role for the uh, private sector. And the solution, may, we may be stuck forever in assessing the global economy, the growth issues, the, uh, the, the trade wars, the, uh, the issues related to uncertainty when it comes to some essential uh, public policy, including monetary policies, we would go really for some sort of, uh, of practical solutions. If we are talking about the, 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 the huge um, problems facing developing countries, including in Africa. So let's just put the facts right. It is virtually impossible at the current trajectories to achieve any of the SDGs in sub-Saharan Africa based on a recent report by the SDG Center based in Rwanda and the data that came from the economic commissions. We have 10 years. What to do about them? I think leveraging finance is a good idea. Blended finance is a great one. But as mentioned by Philippe, it could be really the idea of not just going domestic. I would go even lower than that in localization of investment, getting the community, not just the public and the private um, uh, sources. Raghu Rajan had a very interesting, uh, who is a great international macroeconomist, but he's going into that kind of local emphasis about the role of community, how to mobilize funds, how to prioritize the, uh, the activities, how to use digital transformation in order to provide solutions. Yeah. And, and Phil, DFID continues to use this billions to trillions narrative. Um, why? Do you still think it's, it's the right sort of narrative, the right paradigm to be talking about? Sure. So I think first I agree with everything that's just been said. I think you know, there's some, uh, some issues around the, the phrase, but I don't think, you know, Mahmoud, I don't think you should beat yourself up too much. I think actually what the, what the term really did for us as donor community was really... My colleagues up. <laughs> well, well, your colleagues up. Uh, is, you know, it really galvanised us, actually really focused us on the, uh, you know, on the scale of the challenge. And you know, like you say, the small, you know, the hundreds of billions of ODA versus the, the trillions of the financing gap and the need to sort of close that through uh, mobilising private investment. And it was a sense of the scale and ambition of the challenge there, I think, rather than um, being too specific about you know, having to achieve X mobilisation ratio uh, or Y. I think for me, the main issue uh, that I have with the phrase uh, billions, trillions is um, that it's just purely focused on scale and not on the impact. So um, you know, I think uh, you know, we don't just need uh, trillions of investment, we need trillions of impactful investment that actually makes a difference to the SDGs and not all investment is necessarily going to do that. On the flip side, actually a lot of investors that I speak to, you know, one of their motivations for gaining exposure in developing countries is the opportunity to sort of um, you know, demonstrate impact and communicate that to the, their savers, their shareholders. So I think this kind of whole piece around the impact that you can achieve is also really, you know, really important. We mustn't separate that from the, from the scale. Well, Denise, to bring, to bring you in, um, I'm, I'm curious sort of your take on what do you think is an effective sort of framing or narrative for the private sector, for financial institutions, to get them to engage more fully, to have sort of a maybe more um, detailed, realistic conversation about how finance can be mobilized? Sure, I think from our point of view, or at least the private sector point of view, this could be a trillion dollar market opportunity. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the UN General Assembly uh, two weeks ago um, sort of offered the reminder that the challenge of SDGs or financing the SDGs is a powerful catalyst in bringing wide range of uh, stakeholders. 
uh, to debate over you know, whether we should all have a broader purpose and rethink our uh, business models, right? And we at Standard Chartered Bank certainly believe that. And what um, my personal takeaway from the meetings two week, uh, weeks ago was that there's a big step up from the private sector in owning and leading the solutions to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. I think going back to the market opportunity and you know, the trillions uh, question, I'd, I'd like to share one you know, data with everybody here. Let's look at the big picture, right? Uh, we as investors like simplicity. We like instruments that we recognize, right? But today we see less than 5% of green and social bonds raised in EM, just in EM, right? Whereas one in every $4 invested globally today is thinking of incorporating SDGs or ESG one way or the other into their investment decisions. So this is a big opportunity. I think we need more blending especially when it comes to EM, to um, uh, achieve the risk return levels attractive to, let's say, the fixed income investors, right? Uh, in the West, in the developed world, um, to um, address the solutions or find the solutions. So when, when we talk about mobilization or reducing the risk to get more investors to the table, obviously blended finance is um, one way to do that. And Chris, um, that's sort of what you do. Um, and, and you have a good sense, I think, of where the market stands today. I think, you know, blended finance has um, gained a higher profile in recent years. But I think there's still a lot of questions around what exactly does it mean? What are the best structures? Um, how can it actually, how can you actually ensure that the way it's structured, it's, um, it is actually mobilizing new capital into the, into the structures? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. You know, I, I like the billions to trillions in terms of what, what, what Phil and Mahmoud have said. It's aspirational. We cannot get away from the fact that there are investment needs that are in the trillions in emerging markets. That does not go away by changing the, the tagline. There's 220, 230 trillion in international capital markets. Growth alone in international capital markets on an annual basis is enough to plug that in the entirety of the investment. So I think it's great from an aspirational. I think it's more important for us to be sitting here saying, I, I kind of applaud you, Mahmoud, of, of setting a, an ambition of this. Maybe it's more of an issue of why aren't we moving in that direction at this point in time? The same systemic challenges that existed four years ago during the SDGs, broadly speaking, exist today. The solutions to overcome those, broadly speaking, are the same yesterday as they are today. On a wholesale basis, if you look at the 145 official development assistance countries, of the ones that are rated, the median rating is B+. As a debt investor, we immediately lose a large universe of prospective debt investors just from risk alone. If one looks at equity returns as another asset class, unfortunately, we don't have a strong story to say that you can earn premiums in emerging markets relative to developed markets. The Emerging Market Private Equity Association says, broadly speaking, equity returns are similar. So we have these two huge challenges. The money's there, the investment needs are there. We need to alter the risk return to make it more conducive to investors to invest in places that they're not initially keen to invest. There's lots of solutions in blended finance, but on a wholesale basis, we've got a challenge. The amount of official development assistance over the last four years, broadly speaking, has not gone up. The amount of mobilization from the multilateral development banks and DFIs into these countries, broadly speaking, has not gone up. So although we come up with a great tagline, which I think is great aspirational, it doesn't happen by accident, OK? There, there needs to be strategies and financing deployed to create this, these ri really risk return opportunities that will finance that SDG investment gap. And yes, blended finance is a tool. It's one of the tools, to be very clear, the most important tool to improve people's lives in low- to middle-income country is traditional ODA from a donor perspective. But we need to determine where and when should we be deploying blended finance to catalyze these big pools of, of, of funding. And um, unfortunately for us, although the rhetoric around blended finance is high, we track the annual business volumes. Broadly speaking, in the last four years, that number has not gone up either. So it's around 10 to 15 billion a year. So we're keen to work with everybody on the stage to alter that. And each of us has a very interesting, good story there. But collectively, let's face up to the fact we are not delivering as a development community with a very aspirational tagline. And we need to do things differently if we have any chance of achieving that. Well, 
Um, as always in these transactions, it takes two. It takes the willingness and the risk taking by the development financiers and their partners and the readiness of the government uh, at all levels, local and national, to prepare the road for, um, for good business. So I was in a few weeks back uh, with Mark Lokok, the uh, former head of DFID, uh, visiting Somalia. It cannot be higher risk than this. Um, risk of all aspects, from what we know as project risks to life risks for those who are conducting them. And then if, if we see it from a perspective of a Somalia today, we say, well, this is not an impossible place to do business in and leave the 12 million plus people to their own uh, possibilities of life. But if we compare the, the state of Somalia to the state of Colombia, like 15 or 20 years ago in Medellin, when it was really hard to go there in, in the middle of the day to explore opportunities, now Colombia, Medellin, with infrastructure activities, with a new bank, dealing with some of the main challenges mentioned as hurdles to these billions or trillions, from data to information to uh, uh, project uh, preparation, the pipeline for bankable, financeable projects. Um, for, um, and the IFC is participating heavily in, uh, in Colombia and actually are part of this uh, new development bank for, uh, for infrastructure. Then I go to another model, Colombia is a democratic country that was just admitted to OECD a few weeks, a few months ago, uh, after many years of being uh, a conflict, uh, in conflict. Uh, Vietnam is another model that, again, they take the issues related to doing business, rule of law. It's a completely governing model, but again, the opportunities are there. So I, I was very much interested to, um, to what was mentioned by the CEO of CDC uh, when he mentioned that when opportunities are there, they mobilize capital. And this, this, I think, was following the $12 trillion that came up not from the bank, not from um, some think tank assumptions, but basically from the top CEOs who were basically the members of the Business Commission for Sustainable De uh, Development. They identified areas of investment only in four areas of the SDG related to uh, housing, energy, agriculture, and mobility of $12 trillion um, a year, and the majority of them are in uh, developing countries. What's stopping that from happening is basically the basic question that had been around us even during the MDGs era. Do we have better data, better perception of what's happening at, at risk? And if you are ident identifying the risk, do you have the risk mitigators, those who can really provide grants or guarantees or willing to put their names with these high risk in order to mobilize different institutional investors and others who are part of the frozen total assets of around $15 trillion away. So um, away from what we need them to be filling the gaps with. Yeah, and I think picking up on that question, I think there, there's a question about who needs to be doing some of that work. How, you know, it's, it's not just the project preparation work, but it's the governance structures in That's the right. country, yeah. right? It's about being able to fully understand what, you know, can you execute a contract in a country? Um, is there a rule of law so that you have some sense of stability? And do we have data around those things that's reliable? And, and I think that's um, a place where you're probably not going to get private sector investment investing in governance to a conversation earlier that you know, there are certain places where ODA is going to be necessary. So we've got the World Bank and we've got DFID on this panel. How do you see your role in this spectrum? And maybe it's not that DFID is coming in at, into a blended finance deal. Maybe that's not the role DFID should be playing with limited ODA dollars. So how do you look at, you know, what is your role? We have not growing <laughs> amounts of ODA. And, how do you, and so how do you look at, you know, what is the role of donors? Where do you need to be coming in in order to create the right enabling environment? I think, so I think there's a, quite a broad spectrum of things we can do as donors. And you know, as DFID, we want to be a major player in a space, so we've kind of been engaging across the spectrum. Um, you know, I think, for me, there are, there are basically four Ps, actually, of, of how we have of things we can do. So the first one is building the pipeline of investable deals. So and that's why we've been investing a lot of money in CDC, also in PIDGE, um, you know, to try and develop that, that pipeline of deals. You know, these, the DFIs are able to go and take risk where the private sector uh, wouldn't otherwise go. So, you know, and that can uh, lead the way, you know, to more, more investment. So firstly, building the pipeline. Secondly, developing the products. So we've been working a lot with a, a bunch of partners in the City of London, looking at potential products that we could launch around our African Investment Summit uh, in January next year. 
We've invested in the past in it as kind of cornerstone investor in a couple of, um, uh, sort of private equity funds with the IFC asset management company to try and mobilise more investment for developing countries. But now we're even looking at sort of listed products, which we know they could be even more um, interested, interested in rather than um, private equity funds. The third P um, is policies. So, you know, I think that's where the kind of the whole government policy piece comes in. Like you say, we work with you know, local governments to try and improve their business climate. Um, you know, make it easier to do business, bring down the costs, make them more attractive uh, to investment. Um, but also, uh, you know, there's the, I touched on it earlier, that, you know, the impact story is really important here. And I think, you know, I think as Mahmoud just said, there's a lot of impact washing going around out there. And, and the impact of, of the investment is really important. Our ambition is that, you know, actually one day all investors would measure and report their impact. Uh, and so we've been working with the impact management projects and 2,000 other partners to try and develop kind of, you know, framework for global standards for investors to be able to do that. It's a really important part of the story. And the final one I just want to touch on was, was engaging with people. So the, the final piece is, is people. Um, and, you know, there, actually, we just launched at uh, the UN General Assembly uh, two weeks ago uh, a report called Investing in a Better World, mm -hmm. uh, where we um, basically engaged with the public, public in the UK to say, you know, are you interested in your savings contributing to, you know, to this kind of impact um, in developing countries? And what we found was that seven in ten people in the UK, you know, absolutely want their savings or investments used in that way. That number goes up a little bit. If you look at people that um, have some savings today, more than £25,000, those people, 77% of those people would like uh, their money to be used in that way. For millennials, it's a bit higher as well. So basically, the kind of the savers of today and the savers of the future, uh, you know, would like this. And yet only 13% actually are investing their savings for impact. So we think there's a huge opportunity there to kind of link up the two. Um, and so, you know, I think engaging with people, showing that there's real demand for people to, to have their savings and investments put towards this kind of thing is, is a major opportunity too. So, so one of the questions I have is for the other folks on, on this panel, where do you think ODA dollars should fit into this equation? Okay. So <clears throat> two, three months ago, I made a presentation at a conference. And the, the panel was impediments to private infrastructure development in sub-Saharan Africa. And I put up a slide that had eight or nine items, sanctity of contracts, which somebody just referred to, local capital markets, use of local currency products, capacity building in ministries or PPP units. And I had the room of about 80, 100 people nodding furiously in agreement. And then I had to stop and say, as an FYI, this is a slide I used 20 years ago. Um, and I wasn't trying to be cynical or cheeky, but I said, Let, let's untangle those nine items. Are we really saying that nothing has changed in 20 years? Because I don't think that's the case. If you look at local currency and local capital markets developments, there are entities that are tackling that agenda slowly but surely. But on the issue of sanctity of contract, and all we do is infrastructure, and we do the full life cycle, sanctity of contracts continues again and again to be an issue. So when you have a country in Western Africa that signs a number of solar PPAs a few years ago at 12.5 cents, and then sees what other countries are getting, six, seven cents, unilaterally says, henceforth, it'll be 7.5, with, with no basis for doing so, doing so, and no basis for having a discussion with investors. We all agree, those of us who do infrastructure finance, that there will be times when a contract has to be looked at, but there's a mechanism. And I feel that in, in a lot of the countries we operate, that mechanism is not supported. For me, that is clearly an area where our partners like DFID or the World Bank ought to be playing that role uh, to support. Because sanctity of contracts, we have a banker in the room, will be top of her list in terms of whether she does a deal or not. From my perspective, I really want to echo what Phil said. P persons in the UK have that sentiment. A great piece of work was done by our colleagues at IFC. Right now, the GIN says there's around 510 million of assets under management, impact investment. IFC went one step further. What's the appetite? What's the actual appetite from asset owners and asset managers? Approximately 30 trillion, a big, big, big number. But the reality is those assets under management and the future flows will go into what will become impact investment or sustainable finance. But broadly speaking, they will remain in developed countries. They will not go to developing countries. That is going to happen, and it's a matter of what do we want to do if we want to alter some of those flows. And your question is about ODA. The large majority of ODA needs to be spent on very basic goods, not goods and services, to improve the lives of people living in low and middle income countries. Broadly speaking, there are 17 SDGs 
the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network kind of looked at it, as Mahmoud said. How much of this is traditionally public sector space versus private sector space? We need to be looking at that private sector investment that can be created and identify where and how do we best deploy funding there with a minority of funding of ODA being used for blended finance because the needs are much more significant outside of blended finance. But once again, the opportunity Philippe, you and I have been on the circuit, unfortunately, for too long, possibly, 20, 25 years. We have similar stories like this. The one thing I would say is that the SDGs as a North Star for the whole world is different today than before in the past, I would say. It's much more significant than the Millennium Goals. And I also say the appetite from consumers, persons, shareholders, stakeholders to get their funding into risk return opportunities that are good or sufficient but also deliver impact, sustainable finance. That momentum is there. It's up to us to capture that. And my view is you cannot ask a private sector investor who has a fiduciary responsibility to go outside of their investment criteria and their risk return. That's unreasonable. Generally speaking, the evidence from the GIN suggests that's the case. Therefore, we need to be cleverly, through blended finance and other activities, including mobilization, creating investment opportunities that meet the investment criteria and risk return in developing countries. Otherwise, once again, the funds are going to stay where they are invested now, and that's developed countries. Denise? I completely yeah. agree with um, Chris on that one. I think um, it's important to realize there's two components to this, right? There is, um, and as a emerging markets focused bank who operates in, I think, 37 DAC countries, um, we, we sit in the middle of all these conversations, uh, naturally. There is the project preparation and asset origination piece that requires different um, set of questions and answers. And there's the uh, mobilizing the trillions piece. And there are two distinctly different um, problems to solve for. Uh, and I think the balance between impact uh, additionality versus scale or uh, innovation versus um, speed to bring to market the instruments is slightly different when you're trying to solve for those uh, different components of it. I think, you know, I've worked with everybody on this panel on, on delivering solutions. The solutions are there. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel either. It's just bringing different stakeholders to, together to uh, create the solution. I think we need to talk about the best practices, as you also uh, always uh, vocally uh, say, Chris. We need to talk about the best practices. We need to share uh, knowledge, and we need to scale up existing blended finance vehicles to tackle some of these issues um, more quicker than we have been able to in the past. So I guess my question to follow up on that is, you know, both you and Chris have said, well, Chris, you were saying that the statistics show that we're, we've got roughly the same amount of blended finance deals and the same amount of capital in the last few years, and you're talking about how we need to scale some of these instruments, and that's a way to actually get to greater mobilization. So, so what actually needs to be done to get there, right? So that we're not sitting here in another four years and saying, oh yeah, the numbers are about the same and we haven't, um, I'm, I'm wondering if we can sort of try to get into the practicalities of what actually needs to be done on the mobilization front through blend and finance or otherwise. Mahmoud? Um, I think the impact investing principles have been very practical since the process of designing them to what I was told by uh, my colleague from IFC, Neil, that, uh, we have now 80 um, uh, partners with the IFC signing um, on the principles, the nine principles, and they have around 300 billion plus of asset under management ready and already engaged in matters related to SDGs, adhering to the rules of environment, social uh, development, and good governance. Um, so this, this could be a good starting point because in, in this world really you need really to filter and to help the investors to make sure that their money is not really going to be abused or going into areas that uh, are not really needed for um, enhancing the possibilities of achieving uh, the SDG. So the impact investment is important. The other thing is about the doing business rules. Again, it's an IFC um, uh, product, very... Uh, um, it gets us into some headache, uh, especially this month when we are going to be announcing uh, the ranking, who is number one or who is number two. But, um, I, th but and I think my question on that is we've had those doing business rankings for a while. Yes, but, but they have. So, so, <laughs> so if we've had them for a while and we haven't seen them, maybe it's about how they're being used, 
to more effectively mobilize capital. But I think it's one thing to have the rankings and another thing to actually talk about is, are those rankings making a difference in terms of actually they, increasing mobility? They do. We, we went through uh, different challenges in order to um, um, assure the users of their impact. They are addressing not the FDI, the small and medium enterprises at the local level that are not subject to any kind of privileges like free zones treatment or anything like that. If we facilitate the lives of those people, definitely the multinationals can really have better trust and confidence of the country that is facilitating the business for the SMEs. So they, they have had a good impact on the way that the governments are dealing with issues related to rule of law, regulations, establishing the one-stop shop. They didn't really do a job, and this is not the mandate of the doing business, to prepare projects or to uh, provide grants or guarantees or to take risks on behalf of the investor. This is a completely different business that it's basically the subject of the development finance and the private sector community to do. Yeah. Philippe? I, I think to answer your question directly, and I think you're asking us to get granular here, we need concrete solutions. And at the risk of sounding crass and promoting my own institution or company, I will anyway, uh, and, and, give a <laughs> and give a couple examples because I think that's what we're talking about. When we set up an entity in Nigeria called InfraCredit, which is AAA rated to provide credit enhancement on domestic Naira denominated bond issuance to finance infrastructure projects and to be taken up by domestic pension funds and domestic insurance company. That company was set up 18 months ago. Until 18 months ago, Nigerian pension funds invested in Nigerian sovereign paper, and that was their only option. We worked with the regulators to change the law to allow them to invest 10% in the infrastructure asset class. We work with the pension funds to provide training so they can understand how to underwrite an infrastructure asset. The first piece or the first project that was done this way through bond issuance in March or April last year attracted 13 pension funds, three insurance companies domestic. That had never happened before. It's a small beginning, and we're replicating that in Pakistan. We're replicating that in a number of countries. Those are concrete examples. And I hear a lot of talk about domestic capital markets, low currency, this and that. I don't see much happening. And this is a concrete example of what we, at least in the, in the space that we occupy, ought to be doing. Yeah, and I might add from my perspective, uh, you know, two ends of this whole blended finance chain. It's the aggregation of funding. I'll give you an example. On our database, we have 500 blended finance vehicles, structure, not structures, vehicles, entities that have raised funding for around 50 million on average each. There's enough blended finance vehicles to create. I'll give you an example. Pidge is a great organization. It's a blended finance structure. It's doing great work. We need to be getting more capital into organizations like Pidge and blended finance vehicles like Pidge. It's very I did, important. I did not pay him to okay. say <laughs> <laughs> They're one of several that I would mention here. Okay, But my view on this is that the aggregation of blended finance, funding from different sources is the easiest part of this whole transmission cycle. It's at the opposite end. Right now, we, we have around $4 trillion of financing requirements in 145 countries across 17 SDGs. Some of them are public sector. Some of them are private sector. Some of them are a $100 loan. Some of them are a $1,000 loan, a 10,000 equity investment. And we need to be bright and understand, how do we get the funding financing into those projects? With this aggregation is the easy part. Getting it there requires identifying which projects should be funded and how. Uh, creating the ones that are on the verge of being bankable, investable. How do we get them bankable, investable? And quite frankly, who are our distribution partners to get this aggregated funding into these smaller projects? The multilateral development banks are DFIs. And I, as I've always said, here's another plug for a different community, Philippe. Probably, in terms of the assets of the development community they own, probably the systemically most underutilized vehicle of getting funding into those projects. The level of mobilization that they engage in and getting co-financing in their projects today is comparable to what it was five years ago. We need to reverse that. I know Philippe and I have seen the World Bank have, have act, activities in place to make that happen. I applaud the UK government in supporting CDC, taking on a very, very difficult part of the whole development finance spectrum. So you know, those are my, those are my proposals. It's one thing to aggregate the funds. There need to be fewer good blended finance vehicles that have the capacity to do these things well. But at the other end of the spectrum, we still need to be identifying the financial institutions and intermediaries that will finance that $100 project, that $1,000 project. I'll give you an example. Far too little of MDB and DFI capital 
is exposed to SME risk. Mm -hmm. They all in the same game of giving funding yes. to the bank and saying, you go take the risk. Mm -hmm. Who's taking the risk of the SME, which is the most important uh, part of the whole component? Another great blended finance vehicle is Africa Guarantee Fund. That's their business. Just like Garantco, they'll guarantee the SME risk, which is incredibly important to get the capital and the projects that are needed. So Building on what you just said, we have time for one last question for you guys. Um, hopefully we can keep it quick, otherwise I'm gonna get in trouble for going long. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we're um, in an environment where there's, there's also some increased competition around some of these deals. And that can mean, as Chris, I think you mentioned earlier, that in some cases we're crowding out rather than crowding in, which I think is a fundamental challenge and problem if we're actually talking about mobilizing additional capital. So how do we look at, with existing donors, with DFIs, with investors today, um, about you know, what system change do we need? What policy change do we need? What sort of incentives do we need to change to be able to make this system work better? Right, I, I think in many cases, and um, as many of you were in um, um, the General Assembly meetings and we had discussions with governments and their institutions, to a great extent, we are fighting the last war. With, while we have to be prepared for the new war or the current kind of, of challenges. By that I mean, many people are still in an MDG or at best post MDG era, while the SDG requirements are different. We are living in a world that has m many challenges, including whatever we are seeing on uh, the future of multilateralism and globalization and all of that. Uh, we are seeing the disruptions coming from the technology, and I'm happy that in previous session, the issue of technology and uh, the, uh, the uh, technological divide or dividend came up several times. So what, what I would really say here, there are, there are some analog solutions, like you need to have good policies, you need to have effective institutions, you need to have transparency, rule of law, and investment in human capital. But there, there are new frontier opportunities. When I spoke about Somalia, the, the, the youth are queuing for hours, not for a, a bank or IFC service, but for a UNDP kiosk to train the young girls and boys how to code. This is in a very complicated environment. So when we talk about infrastructure today, we need to talk about data solutions, networks, uh, learning the people, uh, uh, teaching the people the principles of artificial intelligence. And here I think this is the kind of opportunities with a better access while we are focusing on old rules of the game, which is still valid, but there are many opportunities and, and challenges and disruptions that we need really to be very much prepared for. There is no meaning of having regulations or policies today if your country does not have good data system, good um, for its security and for the protection of, of people and how to use the, their property of data, including actually the individual property and the city property, as we saw recently from Barcelona, yeah. when they have these kind of models to protect data and to generate value coming out uh, from them. And with, with that, there is a public domain and private domain right. that they need to work together in order to fulfill these big tasks. Yeah. A year ago, we were working on a infrastructure project in, let's say, Central Africa. It was late September, October, just about a year ago. We had agreed a term sheet with the investor. And the investor comes to see us and says, a European DFI has offered 50 bips cheaper and extended the tenor one year. Will you match it? We said, no, that's not the game we're in. It wouldn't, we wouldn't be additional. If you have found better terms, please go with that DFI. I later met people from that DFI one evening and explained, and they thought that was a great thing because the investor got a cheaper price. And we well said, no, we had established a market price which the investor was willing to bear. You've undercut us. How does that serve the market? And the only reason the DFI was doing that is because like all institutions there and we have December 31 targets. So I know I've been saying this for 25 years and I've worked in public and private. So I've worked at MEGA and I've worked in banking and I'll keep saying it till I retire. Unless we find a mechanism for our common, because at the end of the day, it's common donors behind, sitting behind all of us mm -hmm. to come to agreement on terms under which we operate I'll continue to see that, and I find that absurd. You know, I would, just picking up that point, I think you know, in terms of incentives and looking at the development finance, which we're here for, um, broadly, you know, I look at what the UK government has done with the catalytic, catalytic impact program. Yeah. That is a huge 
leader in my, from my perspective in the development finance community. Far too much capital today in the last five years from the DFI community has been flowing to middle income countries. We need to reverse that and the d development finance institutions need to be involved. I don't know of a better program than what UK DFID and CDC has done in that space. Okay? But the, to solve Philippe's, we can't regulate pricing. Okay? But we can set up structures that will regulate pricing. And in the event the MDBs and DFIs are incentivized by their stakeholders, which is probably where the biggest gap lies, the National D Development Finance Institute and multilateral development banks should be, if this is a big part of the agenda of mobilizing funds to place it isn't, as I said, the DFI MDB community are brilliant at arranging these assets, originating them, and then managing them. Okay, this is exactly what the private sector wants. And if they're incentivized through carrot or stick, hopefully carrot, to mobilize financing in those assets, then they will be setting pricing that works for the private sector to be investing in the assets that they're underwriting and arranging. Okay, so in terms of incentives, I think we need to have shareholders and stakeholders that are incentivizing their organizations which they control consistent with the billions to trillions agenda. And broadly, we don't see that. So yeah, I mean, as a shareholder, I think there are three things that we try and require from the development finance institutions that we we invest in. So the first one is additionality, which um, you know uh, Philippe was just referring to. So always making sure that you know we're, they're investing where the private sector wouldn't just go anyway. Secondly, minimum subsidy, which I think is you know this key point around pricing. And I think there is still room in the sort of development finance community to, for a bit more sophistication there in terms of how we think about minimum subsidy and make sure we're not providing excess subsidy and monitoring that over time because the markets do change. And the final one, you know, just come back to it again, is, is development impact. So always, you know, we need to be driven by the impact we're having, not just by the scale we're achieving, getting deals done. It's always going to be focused about uh, on the impact that we're achieving on the SDGs. And I guess from private sector's point of view, um, the key enabler is catalyzing the, the local domestic and international capital markets and achieving this. That's the only sustainable way of achieving the SDGs. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.